morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on the second Sunday in Easter. It is good to gather with all of you. Um, thanks for coming out in the drizzly rain after our beautiful weather. We are reminded that we live in Wisconsin and it is spring. <laughs> uh, snow tomorrow, uh, which my Facebook memories tell me is common this time of year. But we have nice days and then it snows and then we get back to nice weather. So thank you for coming. Everything that you need for worship is in your bulletin, um, and if you need the music, as I said last week, we're, you know, adding a few liturgical pieces, and we changed liturgical settings, um, and so if you need the music for any of those pieces, they're in the hymnal underneath your seat, uh, as are the hymns. Um, our first hymn, um, if we did it the way it's written in the book, we would have, like, a call and response, but we're all just going to sing it together as best we can. So just in case you know that song from In Another Way, that's how we're going to do it today. Um, I think that's all you need to know about worship. I did want to let you know before we hit the prayers of the people, um, it dawned on me this morning that I never sent out an email this week, uh, but I wanted to let you know last week I told you that Marge Rule was in hospice and she died on a Tuesday morning. So I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but... Um, she went peacefully and, um, you know, had had a chance to have all of her family come and talk to her and say goodbye. And so um, we lift all of, you know, Joan and Stu and their whole, her sisters and everybody in prayer. Um, the funeral is going to be later. Like, they haven't figured that out yet. So um, when I know, I will let you know, but it's going to be, you know, and it's going to be at the funeral home, so. All of you are wondering about a funeral lunch. You don't have to. Um, so yeah, we just pulled them in prayer, and before we got to the prayers of the people where we prayed for her family, I wanted to let you know. So, well, with that said, I invite you to take a moment of silence with me to take a few deep breaths, to center yourselves, and to be more fully present in this time. And now as you're able and as it's comfortable for you, I invite you to stand for the call to worship. God calls us to the mountain, though some of us still doubt. God sends us into the world. We will shore up our faith. God calls us to share the good news. We will proclaim God's love to the world. And I invite you to turn as we are in the season of Easter rejoicing. Um, we are reminded that forgiveness of sin comes through baptism. And so um, during the season of Easter, we kind of replace the confession of forgiveness with the thanksgiving for baptism, knowing that those two are tied together. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, O living one, for you have created all, and you water the earth abundantly. O oceans and aquifers praise you, rivers and streams bless you, all life is sustained by you, our source. We praise you for Christ, the firstborn from the dead, who frees us from sin and raises us up to new life. Here at this font, we touch the river of water of life, bright as crystal flowing through the city of God. Here, death is washed away forever. Here, we are grafted into the tree of life with the leaves for the healing of the world. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this congregation, into this community, and throughout all creation. Cleanse us from our fears and drown our divisions. Grant that all may drink of your mercy and peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And together we sing our gathering song. Can you turn and face the book?
You sent your disciples into the world to preach, teach, and make disciples of all nations. Make us instruments of proclamation so that all might know of the love you have for humanity. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Today's reading is from Psalm 40. <coughs> I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <clears throat> According 
to Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Amy and I have started watching the TV series, The Last of Us, um, which everyone we know was talking about online, so we decided we would watch it. Um, it is based on a video game, of all things. And it probably won't surprise a lot of you to know it's right up my alley. It's a post-apocalyptic dystopian set not too far in the distant future in which people have suddenly become infected with a fungus that takes them over. It's not, you know, it's a worldwide pandemic, but it's not like COVID in which, you know, as tragic as it is, you know, many people die. In this one, if you get infected, it turns you into kind of like this zombie-like creature in various forms, and you are kind of sent out there voraciously to attack other people and if perchance you are attacked and manage to escape with your life but are bitten or scratched, you're infected too. It's super contagious. And so the story follows an adult male, Joel, um, who had lost his teenage daughter at the beginning of the infection. And he has been tasked with transporting, accompanying young Ellie, she's a teenager, about the same age as his daughter had been, from the East Coast out to Colorado. Because somehow Ellie has some immunity to this fungus that has adapted to take over humanity. So she has been bitten, but she has not been fully infected. It hasn't taken over. She is still herself. And so the hope is that if they go out west, there is a group out there that has the medical resources to be able to figure out what makes her immune and then replicate that to give it to other people so that they can protect and save the world. Now, as you can imagine, in a worldwide pandemic of this sort, like society has collapsed, that's the dystopian piece, right? And so as they go, not only do they have to evade the infected, that's what they call them, they also have to watch out for other humans who have become suspicious and distrustful of strangers because you don't know. It takes a little while for the infection to take hold. And you don't, you know, you have so many resources and you're going to protect them for yourself and not share them with a stranger and there is you know, there are competing groups trying to take hold and be in control and have power and kind of direct what happens for the people wherever people happen to be. And so they're just trying to endure and survive to get to the other side. And no one ever feels quite safe and secure in this and I tell you this story because for me it represents kind of the way the world of empire works. Not just the Roman Empire in which Jesus lived, but all of the ways and the symptoms and systems that work in opposition to God's way of being in the world. Right? Empire is just kind of like a code word or a symbol for all of that. In a world in which people are out for themselves, in which we don't trust one another, in which a stranger is automatically looked at with suspicion, 
There are lots of themes in the show that talk about what people have done to survive. Some good, some bad, some turn to collusions with the powers that be, and some go off and live on their own in isolation. And there's all of this fear and violence and greed and power seeking. We see that in our world still. Now Matthew's gospel has dealt a ton with the themes of empire and the ways that empire differs from God's kingdom. From the very, very beginning, we have seen this at work. Remember when the Magi come to find the baby Jesus, probably the toddler Jesus. They see the star, they come, and they, they, you know, they seek out Herod, and they say, where is the newborn king? And when they don't come back and tell him what they have found, then Jesus, not Jesus, Herod, <laughs> arranges to have all of the two-year-olds and under boys killed because he's so threatened by the idea of this other king who may come and take his place. That is the power of empire. We see the power of empire at work in the wilderness, right? When Jesus goes out to be tempted and the tempter comes and says, you can have all of this. You can have riches. You can have power. You can have authority. All you got to do is worship. That is the power of empire at work. We see it at the very, what seems to be the end of Jesus' story, right? When Jesus and his ways of peace and love and acceptance and self-sacrifice clash with that of the religious authorities and the Roman Empire, and we see him killed on a cross. All through Matthew's gospel, we see Jesus grappling with this world that is so different from the way that God envisions and desires for the world to be. How different people relate to one another than the way God created us to be in relationship with one another. We see this theme of the empires of the world versus the kingdom of God play out over and over again. And finally, we come to the very end of Matthew's Gospel. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! And he goes, he sends the women out last week. He says, go tell my brothers and sisters to go to Galilee and meet me on the mountain. And here we are on the mountain, just as Jesus said. battle over who will reign in this world still rages on, right? In one sense, Jesus has done all that he was sent to do. By dying and rising again, he has conquered the power of death and evil. And yet, that work still continues. It's not complete. So he gathers these disciples who are both worshiping and doubting at the same time, and he sends them out into the world to continue his mission. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The disciples to me seem kind of like Ellen. They too are infected with the principles of the empire. When, when the soldiers come to Jesus in the garden to arrest him, Peter takes up the sword. Over and over, they're like, now Jesus? Is now the time? Like they have taken so long to understand how Jesus is going to accomplish this winning over of the world. So that lives within them, and yet they are inoculated to it. They are immune enough that all of that empire stuff has not taken them over. Because of all of their time of living with and learning from Jesus about the ways of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And so Jesus chooses them. 
This is the plan all along. He knows his time is limited. And so he sends them out into this world that has been so infected by everything that is in opposition to God. And he sends them to carry the antidote, to transform the world. All through Matthew's gospel, Jesus has been inviting people to imagine and envision and experience this life that is so different than the one that surrounds them. The world, the life that God desires for us is one of shalom, which is peace, but also wholeness and well-being in every dimension of life. This is what God wants to see spreading in the world, not the power of empire. And so God, Jesus says, go and make disciples. To become a disciple means to enter into this new way of life, of living by God's principles. Being baptized makes someone a part of God's family and a partner with God in this transformational work in the world bearing the cure to those infected by all that the empire stands for, and thus to spread God's kingdom. I just get a little nervous about this because Christians throughout the ages have not always used this great commission in wonderful ways, right? They've sent it out kind of like invading hordes, not respecting the people that we go to. That is not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not sending them out with the kind of power that seeks to take over and destroy. But he sends them in the authority given to the one who laid down his life. The one who commanded his followers to love God and love their neighbors as themselves. He sends them to make world a better place, as what we say we believe changes us more and more to be like Jesus. This is the type of thing that ought to be going viral, or fungal, as it were, in the world of the last of us. This is what this Great Commission is about, the baptizing and the teaching, to live in this new way of life, in the way of God's kingdom coming here on earth. The Great Commission seeks to change us into the kind of people who want the best for everyone, for all of creation, who trust that that is what God has in mind for everyone. And so transformed, we work to make that happen. We who are inoculated and changed by this great good news of how much God loves us, and how different the power of God is from the powers of the empire are sent. Carrying that good news to share it with others. In our words and in all of the ways that we live and move or have our being. And it says, don't wait for them to come to you. Right? Go! That's a key word in this passage. And I am reminded that Ellie couldn't stay where we first found her. I think it was Boston. She has to go. She wants to be a difference maker. She wants what she has to be shared. And so she has to go, even though the risks are great. But she didn't go alone. She went with a protector, a guide. And we who are sent into this messed up world do not go alone either. Jesus said, I am with you always. And so he gathers us too with those first disciples and he says, go. Make disciples. Share this life-changing, life-saving good news. Be bearers of this cure to the powers of empire that infect us all. Go into this disrupted, dystopian world to bring healing and hope, to spread love and grace and mercy and compassion, to be bearers of wholeness and peace and joy, to 
live and share the abundant life that Jesus offers. This is not a hostile takeover. But we come to embrace others in a way that conveys God's love for the world. And that will change this world.
Together with the whole church, let us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten to not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Standing in awe of your unfathomable grace, we pray for the church the world, and all in need. Holy God, the work of transforming hearts remains yours, yet you have called us to be messengers of your love. Teach us to speak and act so that others may come to know you. God of life, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. The whole creation is a testimony to your power and love. Make us people who work for the preservation and protection of the natural environment as a proclamation of your good news. God of life, hear our prayer. Let all elected leaders heed your call to rule with justice and compassion. Strengthen them to advocate for the oppressed, especially where such actions are unpopular or even dangerous. God of life, hear our prayer. Remember those whose bodies, minds, or spirits are in need of healing. Pour your renewing spirit over them, especially Ethel, Richard, Irv, Gloria, Krista, Mike, Dick, Jim, Lois, Charlotte, Jim, the family of Marge, and those who name silently or above. God of life, hear our prayer. Still the guns and weapons of war. Silence the cries of those who suffer. Bring justice, peace, and reconciliation to this planet. God of life, hear our prayer. We lift up all the saints who, gave, who have gone before us, who have taught us how to speak boldly in your name. God of life, hear our prayer. Confident in the promise of the resurrection, we lift all these prayers to you, saving God, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And all things. I invite you to share a sign of that peace with this room.
The Lord be with you. And all of us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. For the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so, with Mary Magdalene and Peter, and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed, and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, O oh God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. 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 Oh, Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Amen. Come, oh, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place, and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great High Priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and all our God. These are the gifts of God for you, the beloved people of God. 
Please come to the feast for all is now ready. for this coming week. Um, you're invited to stay after church for some coffee and some goodies and maybe Bible study people we can talk about what we want to study in the Bible next. Um, and then next week, that was kind of the end of Matthew as our focus for preaching, and so next week we hop into Acts um, as we go through the rest of the season of Easter. Um, and 
and see what we do for the summer when we figure that out. Uh, please check the food pantry wish list if you are able to help with any of those things in any way. Um, and is there anything else I need to share? All right, then I invite you to stand for the blessing. May God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. And we sing our sending song. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.